with the... Uh, oh, t all right, uh, try that again. Whoa, Nelly. All right, um, <clears throat> that was weird. Oh, uh, hi everybody, how are you all doing today? I guess I just passed out on the floor. That's not alarming in the slightest, right? I d A convenient note. How convenient. Hey, Tekking, this is Tekking. Have fun with the review today. Try not to think about it too much. It'll just make less sense. Sincerely, Tekking. Barry, you know what's going on with this? Oh yeah, that's right, you're still doing the whole vampire thing. Nice wings, by the way, man. We gotta get you one of those, like, ruffled things. What are those ruffled vampire things that every vampire wears? You know, it has, like, the little gem in it. You know, we, we gotta get you one of those things. All right, well, whatever, I'm uh, just, that's probably not relevant in the slightest. Uh, this will be One Piece, chapter 1123 review, titled, The Void Fortnite. Dun -dun -dun. So it's the void of two weeks. A fortnight is just two weeks, so I can see why they did that with the translation. It's obviously a play off of the void century, which, I mean, come on, does Robin not have enough on her plate already, all right? She got beat up in, in this arc, you know, she's mortally wounded right now, she's recovering, and she still has to figure out about the void century, and now you're giving her more work. Now she has to learn about the mysterious void fortnight. Man, can you give Robin a break, please? Um, you know, and honestly, I, I see Fortnite too, and I can't help but think of the video game because I was into Fortnite for a hot minute there. Uh, back in the uh, in the original season six, I don't know, this was like six or seven years ago at this point. Um, back when they had the zombies for like the first Halloween they did, I remember that. I was really into Fortnite back then. Oh, is this like some kind of? I hope this isn't like some kind of One Piece Fortnite collab. Did, was there a One Piece collab with Fortnite? I haven't played it in so long. I don't even know if people still play that game. Is is Fortnite still a game that, that people are playing these days? I, I don't know. Can I play as Zoro with an assault rifle and a bazooka and go around? Like, I don't know. Okay. Chopper with a bazooka. That that would be great. All right. Yeah. But anyway, uh, the cover page this week is the continuation of Yamato's Holy Inari Shrine Pilgrimage. This is volume 11. Uh, we have Yamato and Denjiro enjoying some Odin with the children of Kibi. You know, the children that were throwing rocks at Yamato and then Denjiro. Jiro shows up with a net and is just like, you know, nobody's throwing rocks at anybody in my Kibi. So Kibi is one of the regions of Wano and Denjiro is the new daimyo of that region. We knew very uh, little about it. It was very underutilized in the Wano arc. Uh, the only location that we know that is in Kibi is uh, the port because we had like every port, you know, like there was the Tokage port. Uh, in Kibi, I believe it was the Neko port or the Cat port, uh, but we don't see it. So I I'm assuming Assuming this is Denjiro's house or like his manor, I'm assuming it's like uh, the largest city in Kibi where the daimyo would live and uh, you know Denjiro lives there now and invites Yamato and the kids over to have some Odin. So that's that's a lovely time, lovely uh, dinner. So um, here we are rounding out the Egghead arc and you know what, um, you know how like in some anime or in some movies sometimes they'll do this where uh, you'll have the entire movie and then at the very end of the movie, they'll do a flashback to right before the movie started to tie everything back together in like a big loop. Um, this is one example I thought of right I mean, there's a lot of examples of this trope, but the one I just thought of was at the end of Golden Wind, at the end of uh, JoJo Part 5. So you go through, I'm not going to spoil it, but you go through all of JoJo Part 5, and then the last episode of JoJo of Golden Wind is a flashback to right before all of the events kind of happened in part five that kind of like loops it all together in a giant thing. And it's like, oh, that's how it all connects back, right? That's kind of what Oda is doing here with Egghead. And um, uh, I feel like it gets confusing, but I guess I guess we'll see. So uh, the chapter begins with the Elbaf ship, the Great Eric, sailing away from Egghead finally. Uh, it is on fire in the background, but the Labo phase still stands. See, that's the thing. Like, the island was not completely obliterated in that buster call. The Labo phase is there. Punk Records is still there. The Mother Flame is still there. Um, you know, the island clouds are still there. The Frontier Dome is still there. So the government... 
I mean, yeah, we see them all knocked out via the hockey bomb, the hockey nuke from Emmeth, but once they regain consciousness, well, okay, some of them might not regain consciousness. Like, some of the lower level Marines might just be dead from that. Like, here's a question. Can you straight up kill somebody with enough hockey? Now, obviously, like, the Vice Admirals and some of the higher ranked Marines, they'll be okay. They'll, they're all, by the way, we actually do get to see the Vice Admirals all knocked out, too. That was a thing in the last chapter when the hockey bomb went off. I was like, you know, because we saw Dahl there and uh, Pomsky, and they didn't look like they were knocked out with the rest of the Marines, and I was like, okay, I mean, like, I get it, they're Vice Admirals, but if in Film Red, and I know it's a movie, but if in Film Red, Shanks' hockey was enough to, like, stagger some of the Vice Admirals, then this giant hockey bomb that was the hockey of Joy Boy himself should it be enough to knock out the Vice Admirals, and we, yes, we see Dahl knocked out, we see Pomsky knocked out, and we assume all the other Vice Admirals are out like a light as well, but my back to my first question, is it feasible to just destroy somebody with hockey? That might have been what Saturn was doing. Remember that one ability that Saturn had where after he arrived, one of the Marines looked over at him and Saturn just kind of gave him the evil eye and his head exploded? You know, like, that might be actually just not an, a, an, a unique ability to the Ushioni. That might just be hockey overload. And he didn't use it again because it only works on, like, low-level, like, Marines. Like, people that have very little hockey or no hockey whatsoever, no combat prowess. You know, you could just kind of give them the glare of just, hmm, and then they just, boom, their heads just blow up, you know what I mean? So it could have been that, you know, I think it is definitely feasible to do that. So a lot of the Marines are all wiped, actually all of the Marines really are wiped out. The only person uh, that is still, like, awake is, uh, is S-Snake. We see S-Snake still in the bubble on one of the Marine ships, because remember, um, after Ethan sliced the lab's basement apart, everybody in the basement, all of the Cypher Pole agents and the Seraphim and everybody fell down, and then Peter used his, like, sandworm power to like get them all in their in his body and then he spit them back out on the marine ship right so s snake and s hawk s shark and s bear are all still on the marine vessels and they're like you know s snake is there in the bubble like hey guys wake up the straw hats are getting away we're supposed to go after them right i'm also surprised that um the hockey explosion didn't pop the the bubbles you know those bubbles are like reinforced like they're made out of like sea prism resin or whatever and that's like the whole idea why the seraphim can't use their abilities while they're in the bubble um, but yeah, the, the bubbles were strong enough to endure a, like a point-blank hockey nuke going off. So there you go. Way to, way to create some good quality uh, material, Vegapunk. Um, but yeah, other than that, like, other than the Seraphim, the Seraphim might be the only ones that are awake. Everybody else is out, like a light, okay? So there's no way they're following the Straw Hats after this. So the Giants are on the ship, and they're looking back, and they're like, whoa, everybody's knocked out! That's crazy! And then you got Dory there with some power scaling. He's like, ah, so it looks like that hockey might be stronger than Shanks! You know, gaba ba 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 Wait, was it gaba 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 Was it, was it Do Dory that did that, or a uh, Gear, gear, gear. You know, that was Dory. Dory was gear, 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 gear. Anyway, so, yeah, he's like, well, hockey didn't seem hostile to us, but it knocked everybody out. That's crazy, right? So, uh, some translations I've read, it's like it might even be stronger than Shanks. In this translation, it, it is greater than Shanks. My personal opinion, it's definitely greater than Shanks. Okay. Joy Boy, I think if we're just going to set that scale to be like Joy Boy is the strongest or one of the strongest characters with hockey, like, at least stronger than Luffy with hockey and Shanks and Rayleigh and probably even Roger and Whitebeard. Like, Joy Boy is in a league of his own. Let's just go with that, right? So, Luffy is looking back at the island one last time. He's still in gear fifth, bouncing around, and he's like, Thanks for everything, Iron Giant! Thank you! <laughs> and the Iron Giant, we just see Emmeth in, like, covered in smoke and in silhouette and uh, obviously not turned on anymore and just, like, but Luffy still smiles. Luffy is still like, ah, ha, 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 ha. he's probably dead. Anyway, let's go to Elbath! And we get an awesome double page spread where um, the ship sails away and we're like, we're off to Elbath! Yeah! Everybody grab your Viking swords! Yeah! <laughs> All right, don't worry. Don't worry. I have a Viking costume. I have the costume, don't worry. We're gonna have some fun with uh, Elbaf when we get there. Very convenient that this happened right around August because uh, the Halloween stores are opening up, so if I need any any ridiculous Viking costumes, don't worry, I got a, I got a spirit Halloween around where I live, so I'll be all right with that one. Oh my God, all the giants are like, let's go, you bastards! <laughs> and it's like, yes, finally! 
So we also see some shots around the ship and what everybody's doing. Uh, Bonnie is asleep, kind of like hugging Kuma. She's just like, Dad! <laughs> and so that's, that's nice that she's there. Uh, and then you have Zoro, who's just like exhausted. Zoro's just kind of like, whew, whew, man. Lucci was hard to fight. No, he doesn't actually. He doesn't actually say it. Wouldn't that be crazy, though, if right at the end, right at the end, Oda throws a thing in where, like, Zoro is like, man, I'll tell you what. Yeah, that leopard guy, he was tough. It took a lot out of me to beat him. No, no. Zoro's just kind of like, oh, he's, like, panting a little bit. Probably from dealing with Ethan, I would imagine. Also, like... You know, Ethan was, from what we've seen, I think, probably the most dangerous out of the Gorosei, and Zoro fought him head on. I mean, Zoro clashed so swords with that guy. I'm sure Zoro might have been like, oh, okay, I mean, I could probably take him, but I, I, I don't know actually about that. Usopp is just bawling his eyes out because they're finally going to Elbaf after 20 damn years. Um, and uh, remember, so the Sunny is next to the Great Eric. Like, the Great Eric is sailing next to the Sunny, so Nami and Usopp and and everybody are on the sunny still looking up at the giants and Dory and Broggy are looking down over the bow and it's like hello everybody hello tiny people um Luffy finally disengages gear fifth and the backlash from that hits him so he turns into his shriveled up prune old man Luffy he's probably going to be stuck like that for a while because remember that fight went on for like so he went to gear fifth they had lunch remember they broke for lunch after the whole events of the evening which we never found out about and probably will never see. Maybe that'll be in the anime, I hope it is. But at any rate, they had lunch, and then Luffy had to go into Gear 5 to fight Kizaru, and then he went out of Gear 5, and then he was immobilized, and I guess it was Van Auger that maybe teleported him over to the vending machine to distract his, like, Van Auger, like, oh, yes, Luffy, I'll teleport him over there so he can get some food, and then we can do our thing in the background without worrying about it. At least that's what I'm assuming happened. So Luffy went over to the vending machine, he got the food, he went back into Gear 5, he fought, and then the Gorosei showed up, and then he went out of Gear 5 again, and then Dory, uh, you know, Broggy gave him the, 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 the fermented shark crap, and just like, here you go, okay, I'm back, you know? And so, you know, Luffy's been in and out of Gear 5 for the last couple of hours. I, I think he's going to be in that state for a while. He's resting on Nami's lap, you know, as lucky as he should be. So everything will be all right. Uh, then... We have a moment where Sanji goes inside of the Great Eric, somewhere in the giant ship, where Vegapunk's corpse, his, the body of the Stella, is resting on like, uh, like some blankets and stuff. They made a little nice little area to set down Vegapunk's body. And Sanji goes up to him and says, Vegapunk, what you told me earlier isn't sitting right with me. Was this all supposed to be some kind of big gotcha moment? Because, you know, and he mentions, and there's two interpretations of this next line. He says, uh, I couldn't follow everything you were saying, but it was pretty outrageous. So, I don't know. There's one way of looking at this, like, because they were in the middle of running away from the Garosei and the giants were attacking and everything, all this chaos was going on in the background. Did Sanji really, was he able to actually listen to the entire message in its entirety? Like, well, I guess we didn't hear the entire message, like, fully, because it was cut out a few times. But you know what I mean? Like, all this chaos going on in the background, Sanji wouldn't have been able to pay attention to that message all the way through. So is, it, is he saying that, like, hey, I only caught bits and pieces of that message, but what you did say and what I did understand, it was a big deal. Or is he saying that, like, I didn't really wrap my head around most of the kind of science stuff you were saying, but it was pretty outrageous, right? I kind of think the first one is more likely because, like, Sanji, like, the only straw hat that might have been able to listen to the whole thing or most of it is Robin because she was, like, you know, injured, so she couldn't really fight. So, and we did see a scene of her listening to it later in the Sunny, so that might have been her. But, yeah, Sanji was, like, busy running around and doing stuff, so I don't know if he was actually had time to, like, listen to the entire thing. But anyway, remember, the, the reason this is Sanji and Vegapunk, like, a moment between the two, remember when they were heading down from the Labo phase in the Vega tank? Uh, there was a moment there where Sanji and Vegapunk, Vegapunk told Sanji some stuff. Because this was like, this is the last moment I'll have to talk to you guys, Quasar, because things are going to get live when we get down there, right? So Vegapunk said some stuff to Sanji, and that leads us into the flashback. So we cut to Egghead two weeks ago, all right? So this is before the Straw Hats showed up. This is before the Marine blockade. This is before all of this, before the arc started. Alright, this is honestly probably like two weeks ago, 
This is probably when the Straw Hats are, are still in Wano at this point. I don't think it took more than two weeks to go from Wano to Egghead. So the Straw Hats are still, like, like this could have been during Onigashima when this is happening. You know what I mean? Like, or maybe even before that, right? Like, the, the times, I, there is a, a very specific timetable of One Piece. Like, it breaks it down exactly by, like, days. But at any rate, this was two weeks ago, okay? So... Uh, you have the command station in the Labo phase. You have Shaka, Pythagoras, and Listella, okay? And Shaka is looking at some readings coming off of the power plant, the Mother Flame, and he's like, hey, these uh, readings aren't looking right, okay? Uh, there's way, there, there's, there's weird readings. There's like a lot of like science uh, jargon that's thrown out. Like, can you monitor for particle density and, and neutron flux? Let's double check the neutron flux. I don't know anything about physics. Is that a thing? Is that a thing when you're running like a nuclear power plant? It's like, oh no, something's happening with the core. Check the neutron flux. It's like, all right, I'm on it. You know, is, is that a thing? I don't know. It might just be science lingo for the sake of science lingo because it sounds cool, right? Well, anyway, uh, Shaka brings up that's like, well, you know, we designed the Seraphim to increase in power over time. So if we get these, if these numbers are wrong coming off of the power plant and stuff like that, like that's going to have some serious issues. Also implying that, yeah, the Seraphim are going to get stronger and stronger. So, uh, yeah, that's going to be a thing. Um, but uh, Vegapunk also brings up, well, wait a minute here, Quasar. The numbers that were cataloged earlier, they're not, you know, syncing up with the numbers now. So obviously in any kind of like facility like this, when you're monitoring energy output of like a new nuclear core, which is kind of what the mother flame is, like nuclear fusion, you know, you're going to keep track of that, like probably several times a day. You're going to record this much energy coming off of it, and then like the next hour is this much energy is coming off of it. So there was information that was logged into the computers of how much energy is coming off this thing. It's like normal, 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 but now they're double checking this and they're looking into it and it's like actually the energy is not coming off of the the records are not matching up somebody had to replace these records somebody went in there and personally altered the data which means it's one of the vegapunks like shaka figures it out immediately like there is a traitor so they did know that york was the traitor why didn't they mention that? Well, uh, uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, somebody's tampered with the Mother Flame's energy to steal part of it. So that's what it is. So York stole part of the Mother Flame. I don't exactly know how you do that, but she's a Vegapunk, so she knows how to do it. And uh, we're later going to find out that she used one of the sea monsters, the mechanical sea beast, to take that portion of the Mother, Fl Mother Flame and transport it over to Marijua, which is how the Gorosei got their hands on it, which is how Eam got his hands on it, which is how the giant, you know, sky laser weapon, probably Oranos, obliterated Lelucia, okay? So this is all, this is before Lelucia, too. This is before Lelucia happened, all right? So this is, this is a while ago. So Shaka figures it out almost immediately. Stella is like, oh, Vegapunk did it? No! Was it Lilith? It was probably Lilith. I do love that they immediately jumped to Lilith because, like, I don't know. Let's, let's go through a quick lightning round of the Vegapunks really quick. If you decided to split your personality into six different bodies that embody that character trait, which one do you think is the most likely to turn traitor? Vegapunk 1, the good. Vegapunk 2, the evil. Vegapunk 3, creativity. Vegapunk 4, wisdom. Vegapunk 5, violence. Or Vegapunk 6, greed. Okay, to be fair, there's only about two on that list that you would really kind of like, I don't know, but the fact that there's an evil version of Vegapunk and there's a greed version of Vegapunk, I can understand why they would immediately go to Lilith, right? It's just like, oh, maybe it's the one of us that it literally embodies the mischievous, uh, evil nature of myself. Maybe that might be the one that's our culprit here. Uh, you know, prime suspect kind of situation, right? So Shaka is very logical about all this. He's like, well... Only the three of us in this room, so Shaka, Pythagoras, and the Stella, have an ironclad alibi. 
We're later gonna find out that York could upload fake memories into punk records, so I question of whether or not they... Like, being a Vegapunk is such an existential crisis, you wouldn't be able to, like, trust any other one because they can also just hide stuff from you, so even that, like... Like, Shaka could have been the traitor the whole time, and he's like, well, the three of us all have ironclad alibis that I, uh, you know, uploaded fake memories into punk records for, so we all think that we have ironclad alibis. But anyway, no, yeah, we all have ironclad alibis, obviously, so, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I get it, I get it, but but anyway, uh, wouldn't it be crazy if Shaka turned out to be the villain, uh, the traitor? I thought about it for a while there, because you could also spin the idea that Shaka is like, Vegapunk, I am the good inside of you. So it's not good that you're listening, that you're going against the government. You know, it's like something like that. Like, I could see Shaka even being spun as the traitor. Um, but uh, that didn't happen, uh, of course. But anyway, so they got to do a little bit of an investigation now. They got to go into stealth mode. They mentioned this. We have to put our brains into offline stealth mode. And then we have to go around Egghead and we got to do a little bit of an investigation to figure out which one of us is the traitor. So they have to go around and I guess over the next course of the next week, because it took another week, so now we're cutting to one week before the present. Uh, this is a day before Lelucia occurs. Uh, so they've went around and I guess they've, you know, talked to Lilith and Edison and Atlas and York. And after a week, Pythagoras comes into the room and he's like, I've identified who it is. It's York. And Vegapunk is just like, what? Sorry, Lilith. What? <laughs> right? Uh, also, I, I, there's another question I want to bring up. Man, that note with the, yeah. Okay. Uh, we have to put our brains into stealth mode. So the Vegapunks could just do that the whole time. All right. Well, there's a problem with that, unfortunately. Um, if you can just put your brain into stealth mode, like, I am choosing to not upload my consciousness into punk records for a while. Click then isn't that also going to send up a red flag to York? Because the whole point is, at the end of every day, they upload their data into Punk Records. Well, wouldn't York be able to access that information? She's a, she's a Vegapunk. So at the end of the day, wouldn't she be able to notice that, like, huh, Shaka, Pythagoras, and the Stella didn't upload any information today? And then the next day, and then the next day, and for an entire week, their brains are in stealth mode. York, who is a traitor, probably would be like, okay, those three have not, have been in stealth mode for a week. So I don't know what they're up to right now. That's, uh, I should probably be wary about that. I mean, maybe York was and we never knew about it, but the implication is she didn't, well then again, she spends most of her day asleep. So maybe she just literally didn't notice, but that is a question that I had, okay? Anyway, they found out York was the traitor like a week before the Straw Hats even showed up, right? And Pythagoras is like, you know, she's been uh, syncing up fake memories with punk records. I'm not even sure how you do that. How do you fabricate memories? Uh, but if that's possible, then you, if that's possible and any Vegapunk can do that, then you wouldn't be able to trust any of them. I think Vegapunk should just push the kill switch on this one and be like, well, the whole splitting my body into six different life forms. Eh, that strategy didn't work out. All right, well, time to pull the kill switch. Shock is like, wait, what? <laughs> and then it is all, they all die at once. That's your problem, Vegapunk. You didn't make a kill switch. Well, you did make a kill switch. You should have made multiple kill switches. You should have made, like, in case, like, look, all right, like, this is science fiction, right? Like, but we should all know, like, if you're going to make a bunch of clones of yourself, right, as, like, robot clones that go around and do stuff for you, you should think about what would happen if one of them went rogue and tried to kill you. You know, like, it's just common sense at this point. Uh, you know, maybe it's not common sense in the One Piece world, but in our world with science fiction movies and stuff, you, you should probably have, like, a button or a switch or something that just shuts all of them down at once, like, just fries their, their brains immediately, you know, in case shit like this were to ever happen. Uh, what if all five, what if you make six clones of yourself and they all turn on you one day and they're like, you are not the real one. We are the real Vegapunk. And Vegapunk's like, oh, Quasar, uh, execute order 69. <laughs> and they all die. It's like the code or whatever. Like, oh, there, there you go. You, you weren't, you were too naive, Vegapunk. You were too naive. Anyway. 
So, uh, Vegapunk apologized to Lilith. Lilith's, Lilith's not even in this chapter. We don't even see Lilith, I don't think. Uh, it's mostly just Shaka, Pythagoras, and, and Vegapunk. So, um, Shaka is like, I also found some evidence that uh, somebody deployed the Sea Beast weapons, and so that was York sending the Mother Flame over to the Gorosei. Uh, Pythagoras also found the use of a white Denden -den Mushi. The white Denden -den Mushis are the ones that are used to, uh, they're very rare, not very many of them exist, but they are used to prevent against wiretapping. So, the Revolutionary Army has one whenever they're communicating with each other, uh, they'll use a white Denden Mushi so a black Denden Mushi cannot intercept the call. However, because the call originated from Egghead, I, I, Vegapunk is able to extrapolate, like he's able to recover the call data, essentially. So he does that and he, they listen to the message that York sent to the Gorosei at Marijua, like, Dr. Vegapunk. By the way, the way that this was done in the anime was so creepy. It was like, Dr. Vegapunk researching void sensory. <laughs> It was like really creepy the way it was handled there. So Vegapunk, Pythagoras, and Shaka, they hear the message that York sent to Marie Joie. They know it was her. They know she stole the Mother Flame. She, they know they, they, she handed it over to the government. And then Vegapunk is like, oh, gee, that's why they keep sending Cypher Pull over here, man. And then... Everything comes to a head the following day, so six days before the present, when the Lelucia incident occurs. So Lelucia is wiped off of the map, and Vegapunk is like, it's been erased! The details are still a bit foggy, but I have a bad feeling about this. It probably has something to do with the stolen nuclear core. <laughs> and, you know, it probably has something to do with that. So Vegapunk... Um, you know, he kind of orders Pythagoras, like, hey, just keep tabs on all wireless communications coming off of the island at this point. Um, and he also brings up that government probably has an ancient weapon. Uh, he doesn't know, I, I guess, certainly. He just says that, like, oh, this is just pure conjecture, but I'm assuming the government has an ancient weapon, and they were just unable to use it because they didn't have a good enough power source, so that's why they needed part of the Mother Flame to power it up. So, the ancient weapon is Uranos, because uh, that's the only one kind of left. People have said that it might have been Pluton, because Pluton was always mentioned to be able to destroy an island with a single shot, and that's what we saw happen to the Lucia, right? However, I'm gonna say that no, because, like, you know, Pluton was mentioned to be under Wano. I guess somebody could have taken it out of Wano. But uh, the way that this usually goes uh, is like Uranos is the god of the sky. So I'm thinking that a sky weapon and one of the weapons is named Uranos, that would be what it is. Um, I don't think we've seen Pluton yet because Pluton is like the underworld. So we're kind of going like an earth, sea, and sky sort of thing. Obviously, Poseidon, Shirahoshi is the sea. Pluton would be the land and then Uranos would be the sky. So I'm assuming it was Uranos. They just couldn't use it because they didn't have enough power for it, but now they do. They have like a battery for it, right? So Vegapunk is there and he's just like, oh my goodness, it's all my fault. I let my, I split off my greed and I let it have a personification. I gave my greed a human form of a sexy 12 foot tall woman. Oh my god, my hubris! <laughs> You know, um, any fans of Full Metal Alchemist out there, you, you'll probably be quick to bring up the whole lesson at the end of Full Metal with greed. And be like, greed isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's like, no, it isn't. It isn't. Um, however, you know, when you are splitting off your body and making six different versions of yourself, and you're, one of them is going to be evil, and another one's going to be greed... Maybe not necessarily going to be evil, but, like, you should be a little wary of that, you know? Like, Vegapunk should have been like, ah, I wonder if there will be any negative repercussions from splitting off all of my greed and giving it physical form. Nah, I've seen Full Metal Alchemist. They'll be fine. <laughs> it's just like, no, no, I think you should be like, ah, yeah, that might not be a great idea. That might not be smart of me. But, you know, Vegapunk hasn't exactly made the best optimal decisions in this uh, in this arc. So, I mean, at this point, you could just throw that on top of the pile, right? Okay. Um, so they're going over their options at this point. Uh, some options make sense, others don't. They bring up, like, all right, well, what do we do about this? I mean, do we just capture York now? I mean, we know she's asleep right over there. You know, we could probably just go bring her in, honestly. But they're like, no. I mean, Vegapunk honestly just gives the air of defeat at this point, right? He's just like, no, it doesn't matter. I mean, we could we could bring her in and throw her in the prison, I guess. But, like, 
they, the government already knows I'm researching the void century. You know, they've already sent the cipher pool. They're not going to stop. Whether or not we have York here, or even if York dies, I mean, they're going to keep sending the agents to the island. They're going to, they're probably, they sent messages to probably all the marine bases around here in secret. They're, they're ready to mobilize, okay? So there's no point in bringing York in now. I mean, damage control. I mean, so she can't do anything else, you know? So it's like, you know, yeah, I mean, look, Vegapunk, I get it. You're kind of like, you know, defeated and dejected right now, which is like, why could I do such a, you know, I get it, I get it. But like, honestly, do something, right? You know, bring York in so at least she can't, when the government does show up to like bring you, like kill you all, at least York's not helping from behind the scenes, right? Just throw her in the prison cell or whatever. But anyway, uh, so then, then Shaka's like, all right, well, we need to get out of here. We need to get out of here man we need to get out of here <laughs> we just get like get on a ship and get out like just leave egghead and the stella is like nah that's not gonna matter either i mean prepare a ship for the civilians like all the scientists on the island make sure there's an evacuation vessel ready for them but we cannot leave because um you know if we leave then the navy's just gonna chase us to the end of the earth and then we're eventually inevitably gonna die Jeez, Vegapunk, what's with the defeat? Come on, like, it's like, I know the government's gonna come to this island and probably Buster call it, but if we leave, then they're just gonna chase us. There's nowhere you could go. <laughs> you couldn't go anywhere. Go to Elbath. Go to the revolutionaries. At least you have a shot. You're Vegapunk, for God's sake. Just like, hey, uh, make little fake decoy. Like, okay, here's what you do. Capture York, throw her in the prison. You could do that if you all knew that, like, oh, York is the traitor, but she doesn't know we know that yet. There's five of you, and you have an army of Mach 3s. So get Sentamaru on the phone and be like, hey, Sentamaru, York is a, is a traitor. We need to bring her in. And Sentamaru's like, okay, okay, uh, Grandpa Vegapunk, I'll do that. So get a couple of the Mark 3s to pick York up and be like, what's going on? And just like, we know York. It's just, ah. Uh, <laughs> oh, son of a beach ball. Okay, he's like, yeah, right, so throw her in the prison cell. And then what you could do is, like, make fake Vegapunks, make, like, fake robots of the Vegapunks. Like, like, little, just, they won't be good because they'll be made last minute, but make, like, a fake Vegapunk that's like, Hello, everyone, I am Vegapunk. <laughs> Welcome to the island, Cypher Pole Zero. I don't know anything about Void Century. Right, meanwhile, while you're doing that, while they're distracted by that, Get in your submarine, which I am sure you have, and just get the hell out of Egghead. Like, escape under cover of night. Use the Sea Beast to guard you. Bring the Mark Threes with you. There's no way you can escape this island. Of course there is, right? Now, Vegapunk, he does bring up a reason why he doesn't do that, but he does kind of throw out the whole, like, hey, we got to get out of here, and Vegapunk's like, nah. <laughs> there's no point. We die anyway. It's like, no, no, there's, there's not a guarantee you would die if you brought all of your tech with you. But there is a reason why he doesn't do it ultimately. But that was his first reaction to that, so I wanted to bring it up. So he says, all right, yeah, they'll chase us and they'll eventually wipe us out. But that we have something here on Egghead that they never had in Ohara, and that is the telecommunications equipment to communicate with the entire world at once. We have the visual Den Den Mushies, we have the technology to do all of this, right? So Vegapunk, here's my problem with this ultimately. Vegapunk resigns himself to die. Vegapunk basically comes to the conclusion that there's nothing I could do. If I stay on the island, I die. If I leave the island, I die. That is not a guarantee. 100% that would not be a guarantee. You could have escaped, you could have found somewhere, you could have just like gone to an abandoned island somewhere on the New World. Would you be able to stay there for long? No, but you'll have an army of sea beasts to guard you. You'll have Sentomaru to guard you. You'll have a bunch of Mark Threes. You'll have the other five Vegapunks. You have all this technology and all this weaponry and, and shit, you know what I mean? You could out, I think you could outpace the Marines for a little while, you know what I mean? You could stay a couple of steps ahead. You have allies in the world. Dragon is your ally, the Revolutionary Army. You could probably go to Elbath, where Saul is. They'll probably take care of you, whatever. Anyway, Vegapunk resigns himself to die, 100%, and he says, if I must die, then I will sell my life dearly. And so this is where the idea comes from, and even Pythagoras and Shaka bring it up. It's like, oh, we're Vegapunks too. We know exactly where you're coming from. Stella and it's like yes we're going to create a message to the world so this is where that whole thing came from right also very important as they're having this conversation about like their inevitable death 
uh, they're in punk records. They're in the hangar in punk records in front of Vegapunk's giant brain in a jar, right? And so they're having this conversation, and Shaka mentions, there is just one issue, Stella. What exactly constitutes death for someone like us? You know, you were born a normal human, and then you ate the brain brain fruit, and then you lopped off your own head and stored it in a vat so your brain and your body are independent from one another, and then you split your own consciousness into six different bodies. What does this even mean? Like, even if your original body, like, if your body were to die, and this is a question I brought up and a lot of people did, like, even if Vegapunk's, like, heart stopped beating, well, the brain is still active, and the brain is kept alive with, like, machinery and, and like, electrical impulses and, and the goo that it's floating around in. I'm sure the brain's going to get enough nutrients and power from the, from the vat that it's stored in, right? So it's like you're basically, you, your brain's on life support. Even if your physical body dies, this might still live. And what if one of us still survives? Like, the, what about the reincarnation of the brain brain fruit? How does that work? Does it only go away if the brain dies and all the Vegapunks? What if the brain was destroyed, but one of the Vegapunks survived? Like, Lilith is still alive. What if the, the punk records was obliterated, but Lilith is the only one remaining? Would the brain fruit still exist within her? Or would, would Lilith just die because punk records exploded? You know, like, there's so many questions with this. And they don't go into all that here, but they do bring it up. Like, what is death when it constitutes us? So, I think Oda put that in there right now to indicate, yeah, the Stella's not dead. The Stella's brain is still alive. So, clearly, the Stella's not dead. But the Stella is a brain. So, hold on to this for a moment. We're probably going to get a, a scene where one of the Garose or somebody, one of the Marines or the government are going to be going up into the Labo phase to like examine the brain. And there's going to be like a computer monitor next to the brain and it's going to say some shit like, Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Vegapunk, you know what I mean? And it's just like, oh no, he's still alive. So I'm sure we're still going to hear Vegapunk's opinion from things in brain form. He just kind of can't communicate right now. He's kind of limited because he's just a brain in a jar, right? Okay. At any rate. Um, Vegapunk does mention another piece of equipment they have to protect at all costs. He mentions we have to protect our cloud generation technology. The uh, big, uh, uh, the factory that Edison went to, where it's like shaped like a giant soda bottle or like a wine bottle that's billowing the island cloud up and keeping the lab aloft. Um, because the world is ultimately going to flood again, having the ability to create island clouds is pretty damn important. So it's like we have to make sure that that technology survives at all costs. So then, we cut a little bit more into the future where they're just kind of trying to play it cool where they recorded their message to the world and then York is walking around one day in the junkyard and Vegapunk is messing around with the Iron Giant. This is when Vegapunk is installing the Den Den Mushi inside of the giant. So York is like, hey Stella, how are you doing? And then, you know, Vegapunk is like, oh, is that you, York? Oh, I'm not doing much of anything, really. I'm just um, trying to get the Iron Giant to move with the Mother Flame. If we could perfect that technology, it would be great. And York is like, yeah, I hope we do that soon. I'm going to go back to sleep now. And Vegapunk's like, okay, you do that. <laughs> Meanwhile, Vegapunk on the inside is just like, oh, man, I can only pray that it never gets perfected. Right? So two days, actually two days before the present is when they filmed the message. Okay? So that's when, because you see the message, it's Pythagoras, Shaka, and Vegapunk, and the Stella in the background. Those are the only ones that are there, right? So you see Vegapunk like, hello, world, I'm Dr. Vegapunk. Nice to meet you all, right? And that's where the message began. It was recorded two days ago. Um... And uh, we, we've heard most of that. Wouldn't it be funny if Oda just played the whole message again? It's just like, this is the flashback that just keeps going, right? But he's like, oh, this is Dr. Vegapunk. I'm the greatest scientist in the world. And then it just, you know, cuts to Shaka, Pythagoras, and Vegapunk installing the Den Den Mushi inside of the Iron Giant. It's the last place anybody would look. And then, finally, to round it all out, they're going to wipe their memories. Why? Why would you wipe your memory? Like, and you know what? It's okay. I get it. I get it. Past teching. I get it now. The message. Yeah. Uh, okay. So they're like, hey, we need to ensure that no one finds out what we did. So we got to make sure to wipe our memories so that we completely forget about all of this. All right? So we don't want to act weird in front of York when everything happens. You guys, for the last two weeks, 
have been having your brains on stealth mode. And York just talked to you the other day, and she was completely unaware of what you were doing. She spends, like, that's the reason she was able to get away with most of this, is because she spends, like, 20 hours a day asleep or in the bathroom, right? Or just shoving food in her. That's literally her job. So she had, like, some free time that nobody was noticing. But most of the day, she's asleep. So, like, it really probably wouldn't be that hard to just, why couldn't you just keep doing what you're doing? You were already fooling her for, like, two weeks, keeping your brain on offline mode, right? So just do that. It's just like, well, we gotta make, we gotta make double, double extra sure that no one knows we put this message out. I'm like, all right, I guess. And he sets it up to the kill switch so that when he dies, the message is broadcast. Because once again, this is all based off of the idea that Vegapunk just, he's like, I'm gonna die 100%. There's no way I can stop this. I have other ideas, Vegapunk, and I'm not the most brilliant man in the world, but I have some ideas on some stuff you could do, and we'll get to that at the end. But anyway, they decide, eh, we gotta wipe our brains. Now, they're not able... Once again, here's another problem. You think that, I understand wiping your brain, you can't selectively choose what to keep and what to lose. But if there's anybody that would be able to do that, um, it would be the user of the brain brain fruit and the guy that is the smartest man in the planet, you'd think he would be able to like specifically target memories and be like, only remove these memories of the message. Do not remove the memories of York being the traitor. You'd think that he would be able to do that or whatever, whatever. Anyway, it doesn't matter. They wipe their memories from like the last two weeks. Shaka, Pythagoras, and the Stella, okay? And this is all irrelevant because we'll see what happens. Anyway, so they go, oh, we're going to have to relive these moments all over again. We're going to have to find out York was the traitor all over again. It sucks. And it's just like, but Vegapunk's like, well, we have to make sure that the message is relayed, so we have to erase our memories. There's no other way. And just like, okay, I guess. So they all wipe their memories. It'll still be our victory, even if we can't remember it. So just, they wipe their memories. They wake up in the memory erasing machine, which by the way, like, when you're waking up in the memory erasing machine, it'd be like, oh no, <laughs> what happened? Vegapunk wrote a letter to himself before he wiped his memories. He picks up the letter and says, hey Vegapunk, this is Vegapunk, you erased your memories. What? And he doesn't say anything. He doesn't, well, he doesn't say the whole story. He doesn't write down, like, York is the traitor, and you have this message that's going to be released to the world. This is the message that Vegapunk wrote to himself to be read upon after his memories were wiped of the last two weeks. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. You'll find that you three have been missing a fortnight, a fortnight's worth of memories. You were really into the video game. No, you've lost two weeks of your memory. They were wiped of your own volition. A number of things will probably become confusing and as a surprise because of this, which is ironically pretty amusing. So even when Vegapunk is wiping his own memory, he's like, I'm still going to have a little bit of sense of humor here, right? I will tell you one thing, though. The world government has found out that you're researching the Void Century, and so shock at Pythagoras are like, what? How did they find out? What? I have already taken the best precautions possible. You'll just have to put your faith in me and you're gonna have to die. Sincerely, yourself. <laughs> what? <laughs> Vegapunk wakes up. Hey, sorry to break this to you, but you had to wipe your memories. Um, the government's coming to kill you all, and you're gonna have to die, so just trust me, it's the only way. It's the only way. Oh, and one last thing, and then it dot dot dots off, and then we don't, I don't think we actually know what the end of the message is. In typical Oda fashion, he's not gonna give us the whole message, right? Uh, it might have something to do with the Straw Hats, though, from what we're gonna see here in a minute. So anyway, um, this is like, okay, so if two days ago they recorded the message, Maybe the following day is when they hid the message in the robot and then they wiped their memories. 
and then they woke up and read the letter, and then the following day is when everything happened, when the Straw Hats arrived, and then the Marine Blockade was heading there, and the freaking Cypher Pull Zero show up, like Lucci and Kaku and Stussy, that's the next day all this shit's happening. Like, the Straw Hats are here, what? And Bonnie's here too, what? And the Cypher Pull are landing, what? And there's a Navy Armada on the way, what? And the Admiral Kizaru and Admiral and St. Saturn is coming, what? Quasar, what? <laughs> What happened the other- what happened in the last two weeks? Why would I erase my memory? This makes no sense! I don't know, but they're here! Now you know why Vegapunk was so freaking gung-ho about getting the hell out of Egghead when the Straw Hat showed up. He's like, I'm getting out of here. I'm not dying. Screw that letter. I don't know what the hell- that wasn't me. Let's get out of here. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> That's why Vegapunk was so eager to just escape. You know, he's just like, oh, there's a straw hat. Yeah, sure, you guys can help me, right? Let's get out of here, right? So, we also have the scene when they were heading down in the Vega tank, uh, where, uh, oh, Frankie was there too. I forgot about Frankie. When Vegapunk and Sanji and Frankie and Atlas were heading down to save Bonnie, uh, Vegapunk looks to Sanji and he says, hey, after we rescue Bonnie, I I'm probably gonna stay down there and die. And, uh, you'll just have to let me do that. And Sanji's like, wait, what, let you? Why would I let you die? And he's like, I don't know. I just have this feeling that you're supposed to. It's just like, what? It's like, that's gonna be pretty hard to just let you die. It's like, yeah, but... You should. I mean, I don't know why. I just have this feeling. It's just, I have this feeling that I should. I don't know. And, and Sanji's probably like, dude, Vegapunk, if you want to talk about some stuff, I'm here for you, man. I mean, this is some darkness that nobody should really face. I mean, if you're thinking about ending it, I mean, that's a lot of... It, no, it's not that. It's just, I have this feeling that I'm so... I left myself a note that says I should die. It's like, um... It's like, what? So, um, you don't have to help me escape. I'm just gonna do this because I have this feeling that if I die, something important will happen. And Sanji's like, ah, you're... Like, but dude, if I was Sanji and Frankie at this point, I'd be looking at the Stella like he was just straight up insane. You know what I mean? Like, okay, um... I really don't want you to die, but if you're telling me to, I don't wanna. You know, what is this? Is this like an assisted kind of... <laughs> it's like, what is this? So anyway, the last thing that Vegapunk says to Sanji is, hey, there is something I want to tell you guys. It's about the One Piece. And Sanji's like, yeah, what about it? And he's like, I want you guys to be the ones to find it. And that's the end of the chapter. The last scene is... The giants all having a big party. We have Dory, Bragi, Oimo, Kashi, all the giants there holding up Usopp in their mighty fist. And Usopp is like, yeah, let's go to the land of my dreams. I'm finally going to get character development for the first time in 10 years in this story. Woo! Let's go to Elbath. Luffy's still all shriveled up and, and Bragi's holding him up. And there's like, hey, guys, can we, can we do this later? I'm really tired. I can't move. Can we party later, please? And then that's the end of the chapter. No break next week. All right. Um, I I can see I can see wanting to like like modify your memories after all this shit. Like, oh my god. All right. So um, I'm gonna throw out an idea here. Uh, if Vegapunk, this is another alternative to all this problem. All right, that might have worked out pretty well. You know, at the end of the day. Uh, okay. So first of all. It may, like, just the idea that, like, I have to die, and if I'm going to die, I have to release the message. You're, you don't have to die. You don't have to do that, Vegapunk, you know what I mean? All you have to do, first of all, is just, like, capture York, so take care of that, right? Take care of that. Throw York in the prison, so you don't have to worry about her, you know, skulking around and leaking information or whatever. Okay, so you know you know the government's gonna show up at your front door. You know that they're probably gonna send Cipher Pull Zero. Um, you, you know I don't I don't I guess they didn't know the Straw Hats were gonna be there. That was kind of something that happened there at the last minute. But assuming they did not know the Straw Hats were arriving, they could still prepare. You know they could be like, okay, we're gonna get off Egghead. We're gonna escape. We're gonna use uh, some of the Mark Threes and the CBs to like run interference. Like this is before. Well, this is before the blockade happened, right? This is before all the blockade shit happened, right? This was, you know, this was before the Navy showed up and the Cipher Pole showed up. This was before all of that. They had time. They had time to like, you know, what we're gonna do? Let's make some decoys of ourselves and then let's get in a submarine or a ship. Let's evacuate the island. Let's get out of here undercover. Like, let's send a submarine out under the water. Don't tell me Vegapunk didn't have a submarine. He's freaking Vegapunk, right? So get out of Vegapunk, get out of Egghead, and then you could also, I don't know if you could release the Den Den Mushi message from the uh, submarine or from like another location if it had to be on the island. It might have had to be on the island because that's like, maybe that's where all the technology is to actually broadcast it to the entire world. But even then, just record multiple copies of this 
and then put it all around, like put one in the Iron Giant, put one over here, put one over there, put one under the island, put one on top of the island, move them around a little bit, maybe put them on like little islands, like take a little buoy and put it out to sea and just have it, have it in one of the sea monsters, maybe have a sea monster have the Den Den Mushy and have it hide in a cave under the island or something where the Navy will never find it, right? There's so many other smarter ways to do this. And then you get off the island and then the message gets broadcast and you're not even on the island, right? Take Take Sentamaru with you, take the Mark III's with you, take some Sea Beasts with you to help. Go to Dragon for assistance. Go anywhere in the world. You, you can outrun the Navy for a little while. You, you don't have to guarantee die from this, okay? Right? Um, and you can still get the message out. If it's an important message to the world, just release it to the world. It's like, it's like if he's so guaranteed, like, well, I'm definitely going to die 100%. All right, then if you're so guaranteed that you're going to die, then just broadcast the message now then. All right now, of course, of course, if, you know, you have to look at this from the thematic perspective of One Piece. If, if Vegapunk would have done all of that, if he would have, like, like, skipped out before the Straw Hats even showed up, there wouldn't have been an Egghead arc, or the Egghead arc would have been very, very short. We wouldn't have had all that really cool development with, like, Bonnie and, and, uh, Akuma, and we wouldn't have learned about all this stuff, probably, because things would have went down completely differently, you know, because Vegapunk wouldn't have been on the island, right? So, I understand, thematically, but Vegapunk is really quick to just be like, well, that's just, there's no way out of this, so here's the only way to do this. This is, as, as Vegapunk wrote in his message, this is the best possible precaution. The optimal way to do this. I don't think it was. I have a feeling like it wasn't, but whatever. At any rate, that's what happened two weeks ago at Egghead. Vegapunk, at least his Stella body is dead. Lilith still lives. Uh, York is still alive as well. All the other Vegapunks are dead. Uh, Punk Records is still there, so we'll probably see Vegapunk talking through his brain at some point. And the Straw Hats are heading to Elbath, finally. So this is well and truly the final, the epilogue to Egghead. It's over. Next chapter, we're probably honestly going to cut over to see other parts of the world, because it's like in between arcs now. And uh, maybe we'll see the Straw Hats sailing with the Giants, and then we'll cut over to the rest of the world for maybe a two or three... Well, it's usually two or three chapters. It's actually usually only two. But, because we're now in the final saga, it might be longer than that. It might be like five chapters we cut around to see what else is happening in the world uh, before we cut back to the Strats. Uh, bounties. People have been saying, what about the Strats' new bounties? It's like, dude, honestly, at this point, at the level these bounties have gotten to, like, I'm sure Luffy's bounty will go up, I guess. You know, five billion, to 5.5 billion right below Roger. I don't know. But the bounties are really absurd numbers now, so I guess we'll see how that goes. But yeah, that's, that's the Egghead arc. What did we learn here today? I suppose we've learned that um, even the smartest man in the world can make mistakes. I guess that's the lesson to be had from this. Also, just erase your memories and, and everything will work out, right? You know what? Okay. Why not? Okay. Well... Good night, everybody. Activate memory wipe. <laughs>